Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll now begin with the first panel, which is on why intellectual property is a property right and why it matters. Uh, I'd like to invite the moderator for the panel, Professor Mark Schultz, Professor, Southern Illinois University School of Law. Professor Sean O'Connor, Assistant Dean for Law, Business and Technology, and Professor of Law, University of Washington School of Law, Seattle. Professor J. Kaysen, Professor of Law, University of Illinois, College of Law. Mr. R. Parth Sarthi, Principal Partner and Country Head, Lakshmi Kumaran and Sridharan Attorneys. And uh, Professor Ram, Dr. Raman Mittal, Associate, Associate Professor, Faculty of Law, Delhi University. And Dr. David Lund, John F. Witherspoon, Legal Fellow, CPIP. By examining uh, why intellectual property is a property right and why it matters. Uh, this is a, a point that sometimes uh, practical minded people shrug and wonder why we care so much, uh, why it's a point worth arguing. Is it purely of interest to scholars? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, the, the, the answer to the question is that that whether, in, of where, whether intellectual property is a property right is quite consequential. And today, uh, we've assembled a distinguished panel. Now, throughout our proceedings uh, for the next day and a half, uh, we will introduce our panelists simply by name because their biographies, uh, which are quite distinguished, are set forth in here. And I encourage you to uh, review the pamphlet uh, so that I I and other moderators don't uh, spend 20 minutes introducing uh, all of these colleagues with their many impressive accomplishments, and indeed they are. Uh, so with me today, first, I have Professor Sean O'Connor. He's Assistant Dean for Law, Business, and Technology, and a professor of law at the University of Washington School of Law in Seattle. Uh, Sean will begin the discussion. The way we will proceed is each of our panelists will speak for, oh, about 13 minutes uh, and, and tell you about different aspects of this question we're exploring. We have three panelists, and then we will have two discussants who will uh, offer their remarks on the, the, on the panelist's discussion. And with that, Professor O'Connor, you have the floor. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. Very glad to be back here in India. I've been here a number of times now, and I especially want to thank National Law University Delhi, Professor Yogesh Pai, Vice Chancellor Singh. Uh, they've been very welcoming me in the past, and I'm delighted to be back here. I'm also very happy to be with my good friends at CPIP, who have just been doing amazing things in the US and around the world. What I'd like to talk about this morning is a little bit of the foundational issues of intellectual property and how it is property from its beginning, and even in ways that you don't think about it as being property. So in fact, I'm going to argue that there's four different kinds of property in what we call intellectual property, and we'll go through those. And I think some of the points I have to say about the difference between public and private spheres of thought will resonate quite a bit here, in particular because this nation also has some common law roots that will make sense as to how we protect private thoughts of individuals. Now, I'm not sure if my clicker is working here. So while they substitute that out, uh, I will begin. In the United States in particular, and I think around the world, thank you. There we go. There's been a lot of debate between what we sometimes IP maximalists and IP minimalists. I'm not sure how fruitful this debate is, and it's become quite political, which I think is unfortunate. And I think a big part of the problem is that the two groups are talking past each other often in what they're thinking. So what I'm going to call them today instead is on the minimalist side is more of a regulatory perspective. And that perspective is that nation states grant intellectual property rights. They have discretion as to how to do that in their national laws. And so it really is a utilitarian calculation. 
what will get us the most innovation and give rights only to that extent. But then on the other side, there's a sense of intellectual property is stemming from natural law principles, that they're inherent social and personal flourishing reasons why we would protect intellectual property, things that people create. Those are two very different starting points. And I think, again, that the two camps, they're starting from different places, and they're focusing on different aspects of intellectual property, and that is leading to the confusion. So what I'll do is I'll go through that a little bit, a little bit of a historical discussion, and then talk about, at the end, how all of this may not matter so much if we are moving to a truly service-based economy, and by that I mean where everything is delivered as sort of sharing cars, sharing bicycles, where people aren't owning physical goods anymore, but they're delivered as part of a service, and that has radical implications for intellectual property. Okay, so a little bit of background on this. Going back in the West, we had a long tradition, going back to the Greeks and the Romans, of private spheres of thought versus public spheres of thought. So things that I thought privately in my own home were not something that I would be attributed to me in the public sphere, and I'd have no liability for them. I could think and say whatever I thought. When I went into the public sphere, say the Roman Senate or the Greek Agora, then when I made statements, I could have liability for that. And one of the famous or infamous episodes in Greek philosophy is Socrates being punished by death for having said certain things and corrupting the youth. What's interesting with those kinds of stories is that if Socrates had recanted, he could have had his private views and that would have been fine. It was that he was making public statements. So what we had by the time of the Romans was then a sense of what was called in Latin publicatio or publicare. And it was that people would take an intentional step to say, I am making these statements public. I am putting this out there, and now I have responsibility for this. That had a lot of interesting implications. So this public-private line was quite important. As we move forward in time, people then are writing books and putting books out there before the printing press, and they would often try to be open in one way about their knowledge, but still withhold critical innovations. So in other words, they'd write in kind of a code. The alchemists would do this. They'd write these books that seem to be disclosing their great secrets of alchemy, but in fact you had to know the code, and you couldn't learn the code unless you were inducted into a secret society. Similarly, the old guilds, artisanal goods, okay, people were making things. In the guilds, they would have knowledge that they'd keep in private. Sometimes books were written by inventors and engineers, and again, before the printing press, there was just one copy of the book, and it would be written and given to a prince or someone with money who would then bring on that person for patronage. So books were as much an advertising thing as well. Now, what's critical about this story is that there was no lack of inventive thinking, inventions, creativity, artistic works, we know that that was flourishing. Creativity and invention flourished all over the world before there was intellectual property rights in a formal sense. And that is what sometimes leads the regulatory side to say, so we had creativity, why do we need these intellectual property laws? Why we need them is because people need to be incentivized to put their inventions and their creativity out into the public space. The problem is that once they do that, they lose the control of it, if there aren't some sort of other kind of statutory rights that were later created, and then the, the things are out there in the world attributed to them, and that can lead to various kinds of problems. So intellectual property rights that developed in the 1400s in Italy, at least in one place in the world where they started, were in fact a way to get over this incentive problem. So let me again be very clear. In my view, intellectual property did not come about to incentivize creation or invention itself. That was happening all the time. 
but people were keeping their inventions and their knowledge private within closed circles and closed communities. What's very interesting, sorry, I can't see my slides. I'm trying not to look back uh, frequently here. But this famous uh, person in the West who designed a famous cathedral dome in Florence, Italy, Brunelleschi, in a way led the path for what became the new intellectual property. It wasn't about his famous Duomo that he designed for that cathedral. Instead, it was a new kind of boat. And he argued, he said, well, this boat, as soon as I use it publicly on the river, everyone will be able to copy it. And that's unfair. It's unjust enrichment. I will keep this thing private otherwise, unless you will give me some rights, city of Florence. And so they did. So the city gave him, for better or for worse, a th uh, I think it was three years exclusivity for any kind of new boat. That was not the best structured grant. There were problems with it. And notoriously, the boat sunk as soon as it did its first voyage. So it was a very unsuccessful boat on top of it. But this paved the way. And so if you read carefully and look at intellectual property type grants in Florence, Venice, and then as they spread around the continent of Europe and then over to England, they are written in this sense of you have something secret and private that's valuable. We, the city state or the nation state, want you to disclose that. And essentially, it's a grand bargain. So what we have now are at least two levels of property rights. The first are these private ideas that I have and inventions. And what's fascinating is that even in the 1400s and the 1500s, at a time in which, unfortunately, nations and city-states would often use torture and other terrible things to get information from uh, opponents and adversaries, there's not a strong record of them trying to torture inventors or engineers to get information out. I know this sounds a little strange, but, but think about that for a moment. What was respected was someone keeping their invention or their knowledge secret and private. That's the first level of property. And so when you move ahead to the Enlightenment in the West, with figures like Diderot and D'Alembert, the French philosophes, when they argue that these kinds of literary property and what we now call intellectual property were the most fundamental they, they say, if anything is property, it's these things. That's because they're saying things in my head that I've created. If I choose not to share them with the public, I should, I should not be forced to do that. And that would be terrible if I could force someone to say their private knowledge. That's the first fundamental level of property behind intellectual property. And it's respected in common law countries. The next level then was statutory rights set up as an incentive, a kind of super right, on top of that, if you elected into it. So if you chose as the inventor or the person with other kinds of knowledge to take advantage of this system, you would then get state protected rights to put your information out publicly and not lose control of it. So that's the second level of intellectual property. But those are two very different things. The second one, the statutory IP, builds necessarily off of the private intellectual property. The third level of property then is when we manufacture goods or books, either in the real physical space or in the digital space, and we put those copies out there. And because I'm short on time today, I won't talk about first sale and exhaustion doctrines, but that's why that continues to be an issue because the property in those goods that were enabled under the intellectual property, they have their own property status. So again, we have the thoughts in my head or private things that I do as the first level of property. The second are the statutory rights. And then the third are the goods, digital or in, the, in real space, that are created and sold. And then the fourth one that's not focused on much at all are licenses and other transactional documents. So when I license, someone can buy or sell my license. And that license is its own level of property. 
So we have these four levels. I have a chapter coming out in the George Mason Law Review, uh, rather an article, that we can make available if anyone is interested in it that explains this in more detail. And I'll just leave you on this last thought, though. As we move to a services economy, you will see more and more people pulling things behind firewalls, keeping them on their own servers, and you only get to access a subscription service like a Pandora or a Spotify or something like that. In that case then, the IP doesn't matter as much because they're holding on to it, but then we don't get to necessarily have unlimited access to it. And so this will dramatically change how we think about intellectual property going forward. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Yogesh Pai, and Mark Schultz, and CIPC, and CPIP for putting this event together. And, uh, I consider NLU Delhi to be sort of my second academic home since uh, I actually teach uh, IP and competition law here uh, every year in the last three years. So, real pleasure to be here. Uh, today, what I thought I would do is to share with you uh, some of the insights that we've learned in actually trying to use patents in, for technology and innovation uh, and what we see as being more important uh, in recent times. Uh, stepping back, there's some really good work that's now been done in the past 10, 15 years that actually shows that countries at all levels of economic development, developing countries, developed countries, they benefit from a strong IP regime. Um, there is some good empirical work showing that there is a positive relationship between the strength of patent enforcement in both developed and undeveloped economies. In addition, what you find is that in countries where there is good patent protection, that patent intensive industries even in developing countries, do better than less patent intensive industries. In addition, there's actually a causal relationship, not merely a correlation, between innovation and um, stronger IP protection. So I think there is good evidence that there is a benefit for stronger IP protection in really all countries. And it's not simply a north-south divide or a develop, developing country divide or a producer-consumer dichotomy or you know, however you want to split the world. So let me step back and for a long time we've embraced these sorts of ex-ante rationales for intellectual property. Uh, really going back to the work of Joseph Schumpeter from 1950, saying that if you reduce competition, if you reduce competition, then that can result in an increase in innovation. In other words, reducing competition can result in a greater supply of inventions. And of course, that was sort of the driving force behind this notion that if you use exclusive rights to artificially reduce competition in a market economy, then that might be helpful. More recently, we realized that the relationship between innovation and competition is a little bit more complicated, and that Joseph Schumpeter only captured sort of the right side of this curve. And we understand that at lower levels of competition, actually increasing competition might also result in greater innovation as com companies compete with each other by trying to innovate more. So in other words, um, the relationship between innovation and competition is a little bit more uh, complicated than we thought. But what, what we've also come to realize is that, having said that, granting, say, overbroad property rights can also create problems, and it can actually deter downstream innovation. And um, you know, I think this has been shown by a number of people. And we also have come to realize that if you're an innovative company, then patents is just one way of appropriating benefits from innovation. That there's lots of other ways that you can benefit from the market because of your innovation, whether it's a product or a service, etc. 
And we understand that sometimes in certain technology sectors, early stage companies might have no patents at all. And they may rely on things like trade secrecy, or perhaps by first mover advantage, being out there, locking their customers in, and so on. And we also understand that in certain sectors, um, like for example, these specific examples that I give you, which comes from the work of Petra Mosher, shows that where reverse engineering is difficult, Trade secret regimes actually make sense. And software automatically lends itself to that because the source code by itself is rarely disseminated. So you automatically keep your source code a secret. Um, but in other industries where you're not able to, where reverse engineering is possible, there is a greater emphasis on patent regimes. But we understand that these so-called ex-ante justifications have become more qualified. Instead, today, we realize that the ex post justifications of patents, what you can do after you get a patent, is coming to the fore. And we have a much greater appreciation of that today. So for example, we understand that patents can actually facilitate negotiation. It can reduce transaction costs. It allows people to go and get an independent valuation. It allows people to understand what exactly your inventions are directed at. Um, and it allows you to convert these inventions into transferable assets, into things that can, as uh, Sean mentioned uh, towards the end of his talk, it allows you to sort of engage in licensing, financing, and so on. Um, and patents allow you to sort of promote disclosure without worrying that disclosure means that you are assets of value are now going to be compromised because they've been disclosed. And it allows for an entirely new regime of standardization and certification through things like standards and standard setting organizations um, and so on. And it also allows you to take the same technology and deploy it in a whole variety of applications and allows you to sort of have much greater di divisibility uh, of that technology with contributions from multiple sectors. Uh, there's a nice quote from a paper uh, by um, uh, Mark Lemley, which uh, uh, I, I thought is a neat one. He says, the assumption that the original inventor is in the best position to invest in and to commercialize the invention is untrue. And that's absolutely the case. The point here being that you might be the person who's very good at developing the technology, but you may not necessarily be the right person to participate in downstream commercialization, uh, deployment and adoption, etc. And other people and other technologies and other uh, kinds of capabilities have to be brought into that, into the equation. So I want to sort of um, spend a little bit of time in the time I have left to tease out some of the things that I highlighted here. Okay? Um, and um, you, have, you all have a copy of my site, so you're welcome to take a closer look at it. There is a paper that goes along with it. Um, it was published a year ago, um, so which you also have, so you're welcome to take a, a closer look at that, uh, write to me, so on and so forth. Uh, but um, so I want to sort of spend a little bit of time look, talking about a couple of points. And that is that secrecy is actually costly. Secrecy is actually inefficient. Taking a, affirmative efforts to keep things secret when you're dealing with, in a global environment with data centers all over the world, et cetera, is actually inefficient. And having things like patent protection where they're, where they're available um, actually makes a lot more sense. Um, in addition, disclosure allows you to really reduce a lot of search costs by potential investors and other people publicizing your inventions and so on. And it really allows you to, in, in many ways, so get that imprimatur of quality, get it certified, you've got patent rights, um, in your country all over the world, and allows you to sort of really explicate the patent claims that you're claiming. Um, standardization is become a big part of our lives, particularly with the most successful standards ever in technology history, the wireless standards, with wide deployment of this technology. Um, all of us have now embraced the fruits of uh, 1G, 2G, 3G, and 4G technologies. Um, and standardization has actually made a lot of that possible. 
Uh, in addition, today we realize that patents are very much valuable collateral for financing, bargaining, and they can be leveraged uh, as assets in case things go south. And, you know, the time of bankruptcy can be used to monetize whatever patents are left. And of course, one of the things that we also realize is that initially, financing based on IP um, as opposed to tangible assets is something new um, uh, in um, many economies. Uh, but over a period of time, um, things change as people begin to be convinced that the IP that they have can actually be enforced and can actually be monetized, then that then becomes a prerequisite for IP to be used as collateral. Patents are also powerful symbols. I have three minutes, is what Mark tells me, so I'll wrap up. Uh, patents are also good signals. Um, and in fact, I saw a very nice paper recently about how even a narrow form of protection like utility model protection, which is pretty weak protection, is actually a very useful signal to send in China. For example, they found how a lot of startup companies get these utility models because they, f they find that it's very useful uh, to send signals uh, to folks who are interested in their assets. Um, one industry where even today both the ex post and ex ante rationales make a lot of sense, and the supply of invention story makes a lot of sense is in the biotech and pharma space. Uh, the software industry is a little bit different, which tends to sort of rely on a few more knobs uh, to try to appropriate benefits uh, from their software innovation, relying on things like uh, trade secrecy um, and first mover advantage. Um, I'll skip over some of the academic justifications uh, and fo focus a little bit on private ordering. And private ordering really is private parties coming together and organizing their activities in the innovation value chain. Um, and in fact, things like standard setting, patent pools, etc., can all be understood as part of this private ordering uh, processes. Um, in fact, standard setting organizations allow private parties to come together and trade complementary assets and promote things like interoperability so that you have, especially in things like networked industries, you have a common base and you can innovate above that common base, which is why we have things like the wireless standards that I mentioned. And they allow for this process of discovery where each one contributes to technology, develop a consensus, and then develop a certification for the specification of that technology. Skip through it. You know, what, what it also allows you to do is that once you have such a body, you have a standard setting organization, and you come together and develop these and identify these standard essential patents, it allows you to then trade with things like a friend commitment so that there's no question of you not being able to, to say, no, I won't license my technology. You provide the assurance to other people that, yes, I will not be able to say no. I trade away my right to say no in return for some fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory payment. So in short, uh, today we understand that there are numerous reasons why it makes sense to have good IP protection for innovation that goes beyond the supply side story, but focuses on what happens after you get those IP rights and what you can do with it to make sure that your technologies deployed and embraced uh, throughout society. And I'll stop here. Next, uh, we have Mr. Partisarti, Principal Partner and Country Head of uh, Lash Lashmi Kumaran. And, sorry, sir. <laughs> and and, and Sri I'm sorry. It's not only my name is long, even the firm's name is also long. <laughs> I'm making it difficult for him. Uh, no problem. I think you did really very well. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I was reminded of this uh, story of this young boy to write an examination, a short essay, and he was prepared about the cow. 
When he went to the examination, they asked him about the coconut tree. Spot by of course, he wrote everything about the cow and said the cow is tied to the coconut tree. When I was invited to this uh, uh, session and I saw the legal luminaries and the academicians, I said probably I was a little out of place. But said, therefore I said I'll definitely take the place and share some of my interesting thoughts on intellectual property. It is a property right, there's no doubt at all on that. And why it matters, I thought I would share with you through some cases which have already been decided in India, how the intellectual property right has been taken up to a greater level. There was one case of uh, SR Gujarat, in which the company SR Gujarat imported a second hand direct reduction iron making plant in order to set up the plant in India. There was a certain sum of money for that second hand plant, 26 million euros. But the plant itself was employing a patented process called a Midrex process. So the German person said, okay, I can sell it to you at 26 million euros, but you must pay $2 million to the Midrex Corporation of the United States and get a license. Then and only then you will be able to operate this plant because the plant itself employs that <coughs> patented process. The question came up when the item was imported into India, whether customs duties should be paid only on the 26 million euros, which is the price for the capital goods, or it should also include the $2 million which is paid for obtaining the matrix process. The Supreme Court held it must be both 26 million euros plus the $2 million which is payable. Of course, there is a very specific provision in the customs law which recognized that when you are valuing goods, it is not only the goods whose value should be included, but there are also certain intangibles or assets which should also form part of the value. One item was royalties and license fees, which are related to the imported goods, and payment as a condition of the sale of the imported goods must form part of the value. So what we found was, unless and until you have paid for and got the Midrex operating license, you would not be in a position to operate this particular plant at all. Therefore, the intellectual property by way of a license for the Midrex process is actually becoming a part of the tangible goods which are being imported and therefore they get into the uh, level of a property right which needs to be protected and the Supreme Court held it must be this is how it should be handled. And the important thing is all this started in 1979 when an agreement for implementation on customs valuation took place in the WTO. They identified certain assets like this and say the value of these assets which are generally intangible and intellectual property would get identified with the goods and they would form part of the value of the goods and they would be protected accordingly. A very, another interesting case was Andhra Petrochemicals which was setting up a, a factory for manufacture of certain types of alcohols called oxo alcohols. The Andhra Petro had to employ somebody in the United Kingdom and pay them substantial sum of money to develop the various drawings and designs which are required for the manufacture of the various capital goods which were then incorporated and the factory came up in Vizag in Andhra Pradesh. The capital goods themselves were manufactured in Italy, Germany and UK by totally different set of people but using the drawings and designs which were developed by a special design company. Again the question came up is the value of the capital goods only what you pay to the Italian, German and the UK producers or will the uh, drawings and designs also form part of the value? This again went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said no. All the value of the drawings and designs should also form part of the various capital goods. And again, the legal provision supported that. The legal provision said any drawings, any designs undertaken outside India and required for the manufacture of goods will form part of the value of the imported goods. Therefore, the recognition for drawings and designs or royalties and license fees for patented process or patented goods etc. to be used in India 
should become part of what you are importing is ingrained in the customs thing. Therefore, uh, the, uh, maybe not separately in the customs because the intangibles are not part of the customs. All tangible goods which are imported is what is forming part of the taxability under the customs. But this particular aspect was also taken into account. On intellectual property and software, I think that's one of the major issues which keep happening in India. A very interesting case is on Tata Consultancy Services for the state of Andhra Pradesh. In that case, the software put on a tangible medium, whether it's goods, and it could be subjected to sales tax or VAT. Today we talk about GST. Any of them you can take, can it be subjected to goods? One of the major arguments which were talked about was goods means all kinds of mobile property. And intellectual property, by definition, is intangible. And what is covered for VAT purposes is only tangible goods. Therefore, we will not be able to cover. That was the argument which was uh, taken. Again, the Supreme Court negated it. Of course, one thing was easier. The moment you put the software in some tangible medium, the tangible item becomes easily for, uh, to see as goods and therefore it could be taxed. But what the Supreme Court said was, no, you can't give such a narrow meaning. You please look at Article 366, uh, 18, uh, 12 which defines when you talk about goods as all types of materials, commodities, articles which have use or value and are object of trade and commerce, whether tangible or intangible, will all become subject matter of taxation. The important point was, uh, they said when you talk about movable property, it need not necessarily be tangible. It can be intangible, it can be incorporeal. Therefore, what is critical is, uh, does it have a value? Is it an object of trade? If that is so, then it will be subject to tax. Of course, we are all talking about tax, but then the point is we are recognizing the property in it. It's because of the recognition of the property and the value we are talking about tax. Therefore, intellectual property, either in the form of copyright or in the form of drawings or in the form of a patent or process, etc., in some way or other linked to goods and being taxed and elevated to a level of property rights is very well known in India. One more example I'll probably take. This again a case of uh, yeah, Mangalore BD works. For those who are here, BD is something like a cigarette, but it's a local form and it's a low value uh, item. Uh, there it was a partnership firm which went into liquidation and then assets were purchased by some people. And they had a trademark called 501, uh, which was being there for the Mangalore BD. It had copyrights in the various labels with a color stream, everything they had. And on top of that, they also had a know-how. Aroma of the BD is something like a know-how. Each BD manufacturer has a different concept of blending the various types of tobacco in order to get a particular aroma. Now, we had a situation where this person who acquired that old company, he said, I'm entitled to depreciation on the trademark the know-how and also on the copyright and the labels, I am entitled to depreciation. The question went right up to the Supreme Court because obviously the income tax department did not accept that. They think they are all intangible property, where is the question? And the Supreme Court said, no, what you said is right. 501 as the trademark is so valuable, such an important brand that they derive a lot of goodwill and sales from 501. Therefore, it is to be recognized as an important property and a property right. The labels, etc., yes, they definitely carry a lot of value in the market. And the know-how, without the know-how, they would not have been able to continue the same BD with the same uh, aroma, etc. Therefore, all these things together constituted, they said, you can say them as acquisition of some capital assets and do, or under the income tax, the definition of plant will be so broad that we are entitled to treat them as plants, in which case you are entitled to take depreciation of that. All these uh, uh, sets of cases, I, I'm just pointing out only to show that various types of intellectual property, separately protected under the patent law, you have the trademark law, you have the copyright, you have the designs, all of them are there. They, the statutory scheme itself recognize them as a property. That is the reason why you have a law and because you are property, you have an exclusive right to protection and enjoyment of the property. Therefore, you have 
obviously you have measures for infringement and taking action against people who are using it in an unauthorized way. But even on the taxation side, it has been recognized that these are very, very valuable and tangible rights which need to be uh, taken care of. And therefore, the uh, message which I thought I would uh, do as a practitioner is that intellectual property is a property right. Whether it may be because a policy or a doctrinal or economic base, most of it we could see from these decisions is they all come out of the economic base of the thing. That's really what. And also, to some extent, uh, uh, on a policy basis. As society moves from generally from the lower level to the manufacturing, from the manufacturing to service and then service to totally into the intellectual property, that is how the progression, the need to protect the intellectual property becomes critical. The more you protect the intellectual property, the more you are able to add value as you progress in, in, in economic terms from a lower level of economy to a higher level of economy. So that's the message which I thought uh, I was able to decipher from the various case laws uh, which I was uh, dealing with. Under the current GST, which has been implemented from 1st of July 2017, to start with, the definition of goods was made into a tangible and and then they say tangible means that which could be felt and uh, you know you can do that. Whereas intangible is something different. But slowly they have changed it. But all intangible, like if I license my right in a trademark for you to use, they recognized it as a service distinct from goods. But they recognized it what we call as a declared service in the sense any right to use a trademark or intellectual property for a consideration will become a service which will be uh, subject to a service tax. Therefore, the recognition of intellectual property as a property has really matured here. But as finally I say, everything comes back to implementation. Now, your general property or immovable property or movable tangible property, you have a system of protection you know you, you, you are entitled to enjoyment without being disturbed. You cannot be deprived of the property unless there is a due process of law. All those procedures there. The same provision is what is there with reference to intellectual property. The question sometimes is uh, enforcement. We also had the uh, Patents and Designs Act of 1911. Our Trademark Act is 1858. So the laws have been in existence for a long time. but. The critical thing is with the amendment and bringing it to force of the Commercial Courts Act in 2016, intellectual property has been elevated to a higher level of commercial prop and it has been a clear indication has been given to all the courts that all intellectual property disputes should be decided on a fast track and it is really happening at least in four or five courts where I'm handling the cases are proceeding on a very, very structured basis and we hope that once that takes place, I think there will be definitely be a, a recognition across the world that creation and protection of intellectual property in India is at the international level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I thank our three distinguished panelists for their uh, interesting and provocative remarks. Uh, next, we have uh, two discussants who will comment on the uh, presentations as well as the topic generally. And first, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Ram Raman Mittal, Associate Professor, Faculty of Law, Delhi University. <coughs> Professor. I'll start with uh, a representation of Professor Sean O'Connor, who took us through the spectrum of intellectual property protection by highlighting four different levels of property protection. Now, once he going to the history, what I could gather from his presentation was that once human beings had things, had created things, the protection naturally followed as a logical corollary of that. But why do we need 
the protection of intellectual property? Why do we need to propertize the things that we created? So that is a fundamental question that arises. So if intellectual property laws came to bring things from private sphere to public sphere, then it is really worthwhile. Now, the four levels of property is we started with private. The effort was to keep the things secret. Thereafter, through state facilitation, from secrecy, from privacy, the things moved to the model of sharing through the patents and other laws. And then the third level, as he delineated, was the digital possibility, that there is a possibility of putting things increasingly in the digital sphere. And the fourth is moving towards the licensing model with the help of firewalls and technologies like that, where we can think, keep things secret as well as share them through contracts. Now, there is a, 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 a thread that runs across these four levels of property that we can see that is very much discernible from private to licenses. And the private model is very well comfortably talking to the licensing model because through a license you can keep the thing private as well as share it. Now in the licensing model of intellectual property, there is a possibility to share things as well as keeping them private. And uh, another hallmark of the licensing model is that while making those laws and while facilitating that model, the state trusts the owner of intellectual property. Because license as a private contract is primarily within the domain of, within the grip of the owner of intellectual property. So thank you very much for uh, your presentation. And I'll follow it up with a question. The question is that all these properties, we club them as intellectual property. But if we see historically, and even in the modern context, I see four different levels on which creativity takes place from human beings. The first is the instinctive level. level. The second is the level of intellect. The third is the level of intelligence. And the fourth is the level of intuition. The primary tool of the creativity that happens on the instinctive level is memory not individual memory, but memory of the race, the human race that we all belong to. The second level is the level of intellect. And the primary tool of intellect is reason. So through reason, through the faculty of reason, we create. And we, the third level is the level of intelligence. And the primary tool at the level of intelligence is experience. And the fourth one is intuition. And that's very much known to us, but we do not know how it happens. So we cabin, combine, collect all kinds of human creativity at all these four levels and dub them as intellectual property, which is, we are not able to segregate. We, we give all the similar kind of protection to all the creativity at all different levels of human consciousness that it happens. So that creates difficulties. And how do we answer it? That is something for, the, for us to debate and uh, talk about. Then after that, I move on to the presentation of Professor J. Kaysen. He started with the premise that patent protection is better than other forms of protection. Is that right, sir? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now, because it may be more economical, it is more economical to get patents than to hold on to your trade secrets. Now, if we take down the possibilities of standing in the market with, the, with your creativity, how can you do that? One, if you are new in the market, then you can definitely survive in the market. The laws are there to help you. Second is, if you can hold on, you can keep your creativity secret. Then also you can stand in the market today, as you could do it before as well. The third is, if you don't have any of these, but if you have a good name, if you have a good mark, if people recognize you, then also you have a place in the market. These three are protected by 
intellectual property at various levels by the laws of intellectual property. But then if you don't have any of these, then also there's a possibility and there are other models like he mentioned about the model of first mover, the first mover advantage, and that may be an economic model. And the last one is cheaper. If I can be cheaper than others, even if I don't have any of these four, still I could survive in the market, right? Okay, then I move to the presentation by Mr. Patasarthi, who started with an example of cow. Now cow is very dear to us in India, and, uh, and cow has something to do with intellectual property as well. The old case, before we started writing law, we had a case on cow that related to intellectual property, the case of <coughs> King Dermid and St. Columba in Scotland, where St. Columba lent his cow, sorry, St. Columba lent his book. He wrote a book on church instructions, so he lent his book to a friend who was visiting. The friend took the book with himself, liked the book, and copied the book and returned the original. When he started using the copy, St. Columba could not take it kindly. So he complained, he protested. But the friend said, well, it is my labor, it is my effort. I have copied it myself, so the copy belongs to me. St. Columba took the matter to the court of King Dermot, who had no copyright or other intellectual property laws. He didn't even know the term intellectual property at that time. So let's see how he decided this case. He analogized it. The society was agrarian at that time, simpler than what we have now. So he said, imagine, St. Columba had a cow and he had lent the cow to the friend on his asking. Now the cow was with a, with a friend. And when the cow was with a friend, the cow gave birth to a calf. The question before, and the king framed the question. He said, the question before me is, the calf belongs to whom? Because the copy of the book is like a baby of the book. Right? So, he said, he answered the question himself, saying that the calf belongs to the cow. And the cow belongs to Saint Columba. Therefore, the calf must also belong to Saint Columba. And therefore, ordered the return of the copy that the friend had made to St. Columba. That's how he decided. Thereafter, uh, Mr. Parthasarthi ran us through various cases, right? And the sum and substance was, whenever there is a thing, we try to propertize it, and there are laws with which you propertize, and wherever there is property, there is income, there is a tendency to tax it, and that's the way we follow. Thank you so much. And finally, we have Dr. David Lund, the John F. Witherspoon Legal Fellow at the Center for Protection of Intellectual Property. Professor Lund. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'd like to highlight one uh, major commonality that ran through all three presentations about what about it being a property right makes, it, makes IP important, and that's transferability. Uh, Sean was starting to get to this and ran out of time before we got to talk about licensing, but that's one important way that IP is transferred. And even in the historical examples that he used, one of the major concerns was with how the technology, even of a boat, would be used by other people. And even if you know, his concern was to make it his own, he would have had the option of transferring his technology to others if he had a way to transfer the intellectual property right. Jay, of course, spent a lot of time talking about standard setting organizations, and that is a mass example of one way that uh, intellectual property is transferred as its own right, not tethered to any good, but merely one unit of the commercial contract and why uh, the transferability is important. And lastly, coming back to uh, Mr. Parthasarthi's example, that iron plant really struck me uh, as a great example of where the transfer of the IP right was important. There were two separate providers of goods in that case, one for the plant and the physical goods themselves, and then a second for the intellectual property behind the process. It was only because intellectual property is transferable in this form, again, as a license, that the producer in India was able to take advantage of it and use it to produce valuable materials. Licensing and transfers are important in many other examples. I want to highlight a few just to show how important 
the transferability aspect of intellectual property is. Foundational technologies are common across all different forms of technology. Uh, in my background, uh, I'm familiar with biotech, and this is something that comes up over and over again. There's a foundational set of patents for the antibodies, which are now used therapeutically in very routine matters from some of the most best-selling drugs in the world to the newest treatments that are coming on the market. The one set of patents was a foundational technology, and it needed to be transferred to not just the company that invented it, but to every single different company throughout the biotechnology sector in order for them to make a diverse set of treatments that we know today. The standard set of organizations, I want to go into a little bit more detail with that uh, based on what Jay said. Licensing allows companies to specialize. It means, as he said, that the inventor may not be the best person to commercialize the technology. The inventor may have no desire to do that at all. They may wish to simply invent. By being able to transfer the IP right out, any company or even an inventor in a garage can sit back, do the research, create this unit of commerce, whether it be a patent or otherwise, and then take it out to the world and find willing participants who are willing to buy that technology to either buy outright the patent or to license it. Uh, in standard setting organizations, this is typically done through licensing, the brand licensing that Jay, met, that Jay mentioned. But what's important is when the more and more people you get doing these kinds of research, the more and more important it is to have a secure right that can be easily transferred. On a one-to-one -one case, you can iron out the kinks. You can use non-disclosure agreements or other forms of restrictions to maybe make that work. High transaction costs, yes, but it's possible. The more and more parties you have, both on the research side and the producer side, the more important it is to have a secure transferable right, not just to reduce those tra transaction costs, but to make the coordination that enables the market and enables the products in the first place possible. And lastly, there are some people, sometimes where the technology belongs to a group whose purpose in life is to do things besides products. And in this case, I'm thinking about university researchers. As many innovations come out of people who are doing it for reasons beyond commerce. And the question then is, what has become of those? Are they merely to go into publication in a journal and language there at such an early stage before they become economically viable? Or do those important innovations, which are too early for commercialization, how do they find their partners in order to be taken from, as we would say, bench to bedside? And again, the transfer market is what, transferability of the IP right is what makes that possible. The university or the individual researcher, they can create the IP right in the first place. That creates something they can transfer. But it comes with that exclusionary right so that when it gets to the commercializer, they have something valuable more than just the knowledge which may already have been in the public sphere. This again can be done on a large scale. That is why it is important that it be an individual unit that can be transferred. And uh, again, this follows again, the larger number of people is something that makes it necessary to have the transferable IP right. But having merely something that can be transferred is not necessarily sufficient. It has to be something that is valuable to the person who's going to use it. In the case of a standard setting organization, this is merely the right to be free from a potential lawsuit. They can pay their license, use their technology, and move on their way. But the diversity that it comes from the transferability and ownership that accompanies IP allows it to be more than just that. A commercializer can commercialize on their own because they have the exclusive right that comes with it. So I want to just close with that particular point. Transferability is an important aspect of what makes it a property right and why it's important that it's a property right. But it's important that what is transferred is something that is valuable, whether it is tied to a product or not. Thank, thank you, Dr. Allen. Wow. So, Shortly, we'll open up to the audience for questions. So uh, if you please uh, consider what questions you may have. 
Uh, first, I'd like to allow the uh, panelists uh, any opportunity they, they wish to take to comment on the other panelists' presentations or respond to, to things that the pan other panelists or commentators have raised. Sean? Thank you. Oh, I don't think I'm on, so I'll speak loudly. Can everyone hear me? Maybe sort of? Okay. Uh, I want to first uh, respond to uh, Dr. Mattel, who very good comments. And one thing I was not able to get to in my presentation was that the other part of the origins, in my view, of intellectual, formal intellectual property rights were the move from small societies to large societies. When you had smaller societies, small groups of people, sharing was critical, I think. Uh, and so people would openly share the inventions that they had. You would get attribution and recognition from the people in your small community that you had done something. We all do feel positive about sharing freely with family and friends and our small communities. What you see historically is we get larger and larger urban settings the first step is these kind of guild organizations which replicate that small society. 100, maybe 150 or so people. There's lots of sharing going on within that still, but as it gets out to the larger community, it gets forgotten who contributed that valuable thing to the society. There's no recognition. There's none of these non-commercial benefits that we, we would get. So the formal intellectual property was a way, it's a proxy for the sharing and attribution we would have gotten in a small society. And then to Dr. Lund's point, and I'm glad he picked up on that, it is all about the transferability. That's again the part of the story. How do we incentivize people to take these valuable things that they would have shared with their small community freely, they'd like to still share to some degree, but they want some recognition for it, they want some things back. So formal intellectual property rights allow large, sophisticated societies to openly so package up, get attribution, and transfer these valuable know-hows. Thank you very much for those uh, really uh, nice remarks, uh, Professor Mittel and uh, Dr. Lund. Um, Professor Mittel is, of course, uh, exactly correct um, that um, it's not just, of course, patents. It's trade secrets, it's trademarks, service marks, copyright, all of which fall under the rubric of IP. And in fact, you, it is indeed true that for any one product, you might be able to deploy all of those different regimes to basically protect different aspects of your innovation or different aspects of your investment. Uh, so, you know, just to pick an example, you, you take something like Ray-Ban sunglasses, you know, the tint that is used is patented, the plastic molding process is probably also patented, Ray-Ban is a trademark, the shape of those glasses is straight dress, and if there's any some writing that goes along with it, then that's copyrighted. So it, it does indeed all work together to protect different aspects of uh, your product, um, and um, this is, of course, I could give you a numerous other examples as well, uh, just as easily as you can come up with your own examples. Um, uh, so, so that is indeed um, accurate. Um, it again goes to show how different parts of IP really does matter um, when you're um, coming up with uh, newer products and services. Um, Dr. Lund is exactly correct that ultimately alienability is really the most important reason why you have property. It's one of the things that economists always point to, uh, is that you want to have property, you want to have bright lines, clear uh, delineations of property, so that you can actually facilitate commerce. You can facilitate trade and transferability. Lawyers say, you know, property is alienable, uh, but, but, but it's the same idea, which is that being able to estimate the value of property rights, being able to understand the scope of protection, and being able to reduce transaction costs, all of that will ultimately facilitate um, IP trade. And those are the challenges that we face today. Things like valuation, things like scope of protection. And, and, and of course, those things are what makes you know, Kosian trade 
really possible. Transferability. Uh, I think that's a very, very interesting thing. When we have uh, uh, any intellectual property uh, recognized by statute, like your patent designs, trademarks, and all that, you also have in India things like we have. We don't have a separate law for protection of trademark. They have so for uh, trade secrets. Even though your draft law was put in on the website, I think it has still not seen the light of the day for quite some years. But even those types of uh, right, trade secrets, confidential information, know-how disclosed confidentially, even these, to a large extent, are recognized as rights, and they are enforced through the contract mechanism. So because of the contracts entered into where confidential information or know-how or secret information is identified, and specifically said that this inf information is confidential, Therefore, if it is disclosed in an unauthorized uh, manner, there could be a lot of detriment to the person disclosing the fraud. And of course, courts have been enforcing all these trade secrets through injunctions. Uh, therefore, even without a statutory backing in the form of a specific law, of course, specific law makes it much more easier uh, to enforce, to identify the infringements and violations. But still, under the contract law, this is being recognized. And that, again, is mainly because of the transferability and the ability of the information to be passed on from one person to another. And the usefulness or the economic value of that is what really uh, constitutes. So whether it is an intellectual property recognized under law or not recognized under the law as by a specific statute, intellectual property, like what uh, the Supreme Court said, uh, uh, the TCSK, the uh, Tata Consultancy case, anything which is capable of being abstracted stored, uh, transmitted, and used, all of that would get a, a, a elevated into the right of a property right, which could be protected. But one thing which I was uh, always a little wondering was, maybe the other panelists or maybe the, the next sessions will be able to answer. In any other type of property, when you talk about immovable property or movable property, uh, if there is a, a violation, there are provisions, like for example, you trespass into your property, I can go on to the Indian Penal Court for trespassing and there could be criminal um, uh, consequences as well. But when it comes to intellectual property, why for trademark and copyright we do have both civil and criminal remedies? But if, when it comes to things like patents, we don't have a criminal remedy. Not that uh, uh, it must be there, I'm saying, but a, a set of criminal remedies sometimes also becomes very, very critical in its enforcement and then people trying to determine Oh, okay, I am violating somebody's property, I need to be careful. Uh, that's probably, I don't know why, is there any other historical reason, maybe some of them should be able to highlight. Why in some IP laws we don't have a criminal um, a side of it, whereas in some IP laws we have both criminal and civil consequences. Thank you. Violation, but that definitely is an important aspect. We have uh, the civil as well as criminal law to, to, to aid us for trademark infringement, copyright infringement, even trade secret infringement. It's not just the breach of contract. If you give it under contract, then it's okay. It's a breach of contract. But we are not necessarily restricted by the theory of contract. There's a whole tort law. There's a criminal law. We have a theory of criminal breach of trust as well. So uh, so, so we have we have all these theories uh, with us. And why why historically the patent law was without any criminal remedy? I, I, I don't I wish to suggest that there should be, but I'm I, I may suggest on the reverse side, from other uh, intellectual property tools, we can discount the angle of criminality, at least to some extent. Thank you so much. Um, strangely, I actually do have a little bit of a thought from previous work I've done on the criminality aspect. And one of the concerns with having a criminal statute for patentability was the idea that patents are sometimes found to be invalid on their own terms, whether for anticipation or obviousness. And it's therefore sometimes thought of more of a you know, economic risk to make those kind of copies. Uh, that's rarely, to my knowledge, have ever been seen in copyright or trademarks, where if it's, you know, if copyright is invalid because it would already been done before the person who claimed the copyright, you know, was themselves the copyist, there's, that's a, either a rare case or something we're not too worried about. Um, I don't know how much that, uh, you know, is applied in more, that 
work was more professional as opposed to academic, so I don't know how much of that is in the academic work, but that was one of the reasons I've come across for why that uh, difference exists. enforcement uh, is that I, I believe one point of differentiation be, as to whether you need criminal uh, criminal enforcement or not is just how much help you need from the government in enforcing your rights. Uh, patents are usually uh, it's owned by entities that uh, can engage in self-help but when you're dealing with counterfeiters you're often uh, up against organized crime and in the case of trade secret theft, sometimes you're, you're up against uh, state-sponsored uh, foreign economic espionage. And in those instances, it can be much harder to uh, engage in self-help. Uh, well, the, uh, I will, uh, as moderator's privilege, and just to perhaps uh, make a uh, final organizing, uh, put, put a final organizing stamp on the conference and panel, I'd like to bring up one issue for the panelists and commentators. Uh, there is, a, when we say intellectual property is property, uh, we we mean as opposed to something else. <laughs> and there are other things you could do to encourage innovation, to encourage creativity. Uh, you could, for example, award prizes, but not allow the uh, intellectual property originator, the, the innovator or creator, any exclusive rights to control or dispose of, of the property. Um, you could also perhaps have a simple liability rule. You create something uh, and you will get paid if somebody uses it. Uh, you can sue them perhaps to demand payment, uh, but you have no exclusive right to control it. Um, why is property, why is treating something as, how is treating something as a property right different from say, awarding a prize or having a liability rule, and why might it be better? Well, I think here's the question that underlies some of this. It's the assumption that we have to really address. I think in my account, I'm trying to argue that it, again, is so fundamentally internal to what we do that nothing but a sense of property to it, not in a kind of enclosure, but in the fact that I have this thing, and if I'm going to bring it out and do something with it, then I want to know that I would have some protections and you can't force me to do it otherwise. Would prizes pull that out from me? It might. Uh, but the problem for prizes can often be that we don't really factor in then how to commercialize the invention and the creation from that. It's just a lump sum of money. And then what happens in the marketplace after that? And that's when then we have Jay's point, Chris Kaysan's point, and Dr. Lund's points, and others about packaging up and transferring. Um, liability regime, again, for my fundamental starting natural law point of the ideas in my head, well, that seems a little harsh that somebody could just sort of torture me to force me to disclose something, and then, oh, sorry, we'll just pay you some money now to make it better. Now, I'm not saying it's against Professor Schultz. I'm just trying to give why I think there is this fundamental, natural to the things you have. Now, the question about how it gets transferred once we're outside of that and some of the formal regimes, we can discuss that a little bit. But starting from that fundamental point is why we get this, why it has to be property at some at least natural law level. We could have different regimes for incentivizing innovation. We could have, every time you get a patent, we might decide to give you 500 rupees. We could do that. We could, we could provide some prize. We could, if you want to start an industry based on your patents, we could award tax credits. You know, we could do all that. But what the patent system does is something that is a little bit less intrusive and lets the market decide. So what you get is a set of exclusive rights, but you don't get anything else. It's up to the market to decide if people want your technology or not. There are some good empirical studies done that show that something like 13% of all patents are licensed. So that means 87% of all patents are worth toilet paper. 
Nobody cares for your stuff. It's great, it's innovative, take your patent. But nobody cares. So, but we let the markets pick the winners and losers. Who wants your stuff? You know, who wants your technology? Okay? And as far as liability regimes, etc., you know, some of these patents might be the Cohen Boyer gene splicing patent. Amazing stuff. It might be the page rank algorithm patent that launched Google. Or it might be some more important, but perhaps less valuable inventions. And you know, we don't sort of force a compulsory licensing scheme like a liability regime, et cetera. In some ways, what it really shows is that we're trying to be as to be least intrusive. You grant a property rights and see where it takes you. It may not take you anywhere, but that's just the way it goes. So you know, keep inventing, keep innovating. Maybe you'll be lucky next time. Any other property, immovable property, immovables, maybe 85, 90% of it may be not worth it or nobody is even bothered about what property you have. But it's always the core which is really at the cutting edge and which is really important is where all the infringement or everything uh, really take place. So uh, that uh, what you said, maybe 90% of the patents are not worth a paper they are written on. It's fair, but still, there is a scheme and slowly people have said, Many of them are patenting only to ensure that I am not prevented from uh, you know, practicing what I have been practicing. That's really what uh, many of these uh, patents are coming to. The other interesting thing is as compared to the trademark and the copyrights, etc., where you uh, talk about a positive right uh, to practice, on the uh, patent side, you are really talking about a negative right to prevent others because whether you can practice your patentable invention or a product or a process depends on the other fences which are around that. You may still have a patent, but you may not be able to practice it. But when it comes to trademark and copyrights, you also have a positive right to uh, practice. But just like any other property which you have, which can probably be requisitioned by the government, subject to following the rules of procedure, we do have such measures like compulsory licensing in case of uh, requirements. So to a lot of extent, even though uh, the question was property as opposed to what, as opposed to something else. But I think uh, these are recognized like any other property. And whatever rights you get from enjoying other types of property, you get to enjoy those types of uh, um, uh, rights with reference to these properties. But some of them, like patent, are also time limited. Of course, that's uh, by definition they are time limited. But some of them, like trademark, you can continuously, uh, uh, you know, have them renewed and you can use them for a lifetime of measure. So in, in that uh, sense, I feel intellectual property is probably uh, more or less merging into the mainstream uh, property, and whatever protection and whatever benefits you arise out of those properties, you probably continue to enjoy with the intellectual property as well. always had very different models of protecting human creativity. And property is just one model. If we peep into the days gone by, when we didn't have this property model in the strict sense of the term, I would like to take you to one of the legendary kings of India, that is uh, King Ashok the Great. So he had employed Navaratnas, that means nine jewels, in his court. Those nine persons were very gifted. Someone was gifted an um, author, someone was gifted in a poet, some in another sense. So royal patronage, the patronage of the state was there with them. That is one model. But if we contrast it with today's model, today's model as, as uh, Sean has uh, said and uh, Professor Jay Kirsten, that is totally market oriented. We individual creator and the market. Let the individual creator create and, and, and put his creativity, the result of his creativity in the market. If it is worth its while, it will stand up in the market and the creator will survive. If the market doesn't respect, it will, the, the creator will, be, will not be able to live by his creation. That's a very simple market-oriented model. Now, between these two models, extreme models, there are various other models that we have already experimented or we could experiment. For example, there's a model of liability which may also be described as a library model. All human creativity goes to a common library of mankind. And from there, if anybody has to 
use it, has to take it, he is free to take it. It's not control. Only the control mechanism is the, he will have to share something, he will have to pay for it. And the payment, the, reserve, the reward will go to ultimately the creator. And we can make such a mechanism. So there are various models. And this is not just the, the, the only one model that we have, that we have today. But then we, we can experiment with other models as well. Thank you. So the, one of the main differences between this property rule and the alternatives that Mark suggested, and actually a new one that uh, Professor Mittal just started to hint at, is that the non-property rules are typically undervaluing the value of the innovations. Uh, you know, prizes, liability rules, and government funding ultimately all have somebody deciding the value of the invention, either without knowing what it is, or ex post when everything might seem obvious or have a public good. This is particularly concerning, of course, in the pharmaceutical sector, where you do, in some countries, see compulsory licenses where the value of the license is set at how to cheapen the drug as opposed to how valuable was the innovation. And then, uh, just to, to make something explicit that I thought was interesting, which is, in addition to prizes and liability rules, the government funding of discoveries and innovations often also brought up as an alternative to property rules. And it does have a place, you know, universities do generate very, very important innovations, some of which are patented, some of which are not. So, you know, to the extent that we think about this as an either or, oftentimes that may be incomplete, and we need to think about where these different uh, incentives can be complementary, and that is one particular example where they can be and are well known to be. Thank you. Now we will uh, take questions from the audience. We have microphones, so if you wait till the microphone comes to you, sir. And you may address your question to any particular panelists, and as many panelists or as few can answer it as they wish. So, uh, sir, over here in the front. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is for Professor Sean O'Gordon. Uh, you quoted three, three stories of sovereigns, the Adams and the Brunerschi of the Italy who designed the world to say. So you're talking about the Adams who wrote in secret languages because they were scared that their society was stolen. Brunerschi who got three years exclusively for this right of vote. So somewhere down the line, even the state has an interest to know their stories because even the state knows if their secret is out, that would be helpful to the society at large. And that imposes a positive on the state to make sure that I provide an ambiguous ground where they are happily giving up their ideas. In that scenario, in a positive state, due to the state, how do you see compulsory licensing? Uh, I'd like to make two points more. Uh, does the state goes like a, an adherent IP enforcer, who is always giving IP rights, or a moderate IP enforcer, who on situations can take away the IP right? Under that scenario, under that light, how do you see compulsory licensing? One thing I want to mention that was important about the story is uh, that in the secret society knowledge, it was not just commercial interests, but it was the concern that with groups like the Pythagoreans and other neo-Platonic groups, that if their views got out, they would be punished because it was uh, magic or, or witchcraft or other kinds of things. So it's super important to think about these other aspects about why people want to keep the, the knowledge secret. So now your question is the proper one, so how does the state then incentivize and give a protective regime for that? And so what the core issue is, is for the individuals to feel like I will then voluntarily participate in that situation. So compulsory licenses have to always have an eye to that fairness to the person then who has already chosen to disclose out. So in some ways, the challenge you have with a compulsory license regime is then looking at after it's been in place for a while and see if people are still incentivized enough to try to share beyond a, a private sphere. So and then let me just make one point uh, uh, with that. So if you um, have a pure property regime and people are disclosing, and then later on you add compulsory licenses, it does change that, that bargain for them, the conditions on which they, they put their things out there. 
And so then you need to wait a little bit and see if that's going to impact how likely people are to disclose, whether they'll keep private or move somewhere else. And then the final point is, and we don't talk about this enough with intellectual property, except in, in Europe where you have things like moral rights, thinking about attribution and integrity. How much do we protect the individual who has voluntarily disclosed from liability for what seem like uh, uh, unpopular ideas or even technologies that create problems? Other questions? Um, yes, we have several. Um, let's see, this gentleman in front here. If you could state uh, who you are and where you're from. Just go ahead. I would like to extend my warm welcome to the jury, the dignity of that. And my question is this, that as Sir said that in certain IP laws, there is a criminal provision, but why not in others? And as per Sir, it should be in others as well. But I do have a different perception. I feel that it should be abolished from all. The reason behind this is that the purpose of IPO is this that we should we should protect others from being benefited on most of others. Instead of criminal provision, we should uh, we should bring certain penalty provision. So uh, so that as uh, as I said that others should not be benefited on cost of others. But if in form of penalty, if we we can pay the cost to them, cost to the owner, then I don't think so that there is any need of uh, criminal life. This is one of the suggestions, and this is subject to the correction by the jury. Any, any comments on the comments? not say that you must have a, a criminal thing for pet. I was only wondering why in certain IPs you have and why you don't have. Whether you should have a criminal proceeding in all IPs or not, I think it's again a policy decision. Maybe we can have another a seminar on that. Uh, the point I was only, why is there's a difference? And even where you have a criminal proceeding, if you generally see the law, the law does not want to say a punish in every case. It, it may generally say, Maybe imprisonment or fine or both. This is the standard terms which will be used in most of these statutes. And unless there's really something critical, most of the time you may be able to get away only with a fine and probably a warning. Uh, but the fact is, in any case, in types of infringement, when you go for civil, you are getting damages, which in a, in a, in a sense is a penalty which you're doing it. Uh, therefore, the question whether you should have criminal uh, uh, side for intellectual property because I was only uh, talking in the context of property. In, in respect of the removal property, there is a trespass saying, or if you have removal property, if somebody is stealing, it is certainly actionable on the criminal side. So if you are taking away somebody's uh, property, intellectual property, that's akin to stealing. So why should not uh, there be a criminal? Uh, of course, you are talking about men's reactors, yes, all those things will be there. So it was only a general question as to why in certain uh, intellectual property rights you have this provision and you don't have. I am not advocating for a moment that it should be there or it should not be there. I my point, if it is there, how to administer it and how to get it enforced. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Can I make a real short? Yes, please go ahead. Um, your question is a very good one. And there is a very good literature on criminal liability for IP that I would direct you to. This has um, been studied quite extensively. And what you'll find is a couple of things in common, that criminal liabilities imposed in very narrow circumstances where there is some real flagrant bad conduct that you're trying to personally hold a person liable for deterrence, like massive counterfeiting, for example, in China is a criminal offense. So you'll find that the baseline is in fact some civil remedies, injunctions or damages, and that criminal liability is very much the exception in very narrow circumstances. And on the left here, yes. Patent, 
So, um, as I understand your question, shouldn't we make compulsory licensing part of the patent system, particularly in the case of pharmaceuticals? That's the question. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I mean, so I think it actually is, goes right back to a point that Professor O'Connor made, which is it would be great to see, do an empirical study, and look at innovation where you don't have compulsory licensing and look at the investments and look at what is the output and look at situations where there is compulsory licensing and actually see if there is in fact a difference in the supply of invention in areas where compulsory licensing regimes have been put in place, which by now, by the way, there is an extensive empirical literature saying that any kind of compulsory licensing regime is all, the compensation is significantly below fair market value, okay? So the question is, as a policy matter, let's see what the data shows. And so that you can sort of decide, hey, I, am, I find that in these kinds of compulsory licensing regimes, in fact, it doesn't make a difference and that we still see tremendous innovation. Or in fact, actually, you, know, you see a significant impact, and so it doesn't make sense to have compulsory licensing. I, I, I don't know. It's, it is a um, empirical question that is uh, you know, worth looking into carefully. I think Dr. Lund had a comment. Uh, yeah, Jay actually hit the main point I wanted to make, which is, uh, you know, to the extent of study, compulsory licenses are typically far below the value a pharmaceutical company would expect to get from their own innovations uh, left to market them uh, under their usual and normal terms. But one extra thing I do want to highlight is, you know, right now there's a you know, vast difference between many countries between those that have compulsory licensing and those that don't. And it tends to flow, you know, the innovation is happening in those countries where compulsory licensing either isn't available at all or is rarely used, even if it is available. And you know, that's been static now for a few years. And you know, to follow up on what Jay and Sean were both saying, it'd be interesting to see if there are changes that we could study, you know, how that impacts uh, going forward. So, so do you think that more more policy should be made on international platform for compulsory I'm I'm sorry, we can't hear you. The the microphone's breaking up. I'd also like to allow uh, an opportunity for another questioner uh, who was right behind you there. You. Yes, ma'am. Firstly, a very good morning to um, all the panelists. Uh, I am Ankita Sabarwal. I'm a fourth year law student at IT University. My question is to Professor Jay Kaysen. So you spoke about the supremacy of patent protection in India. Uh, my question to you is based on a very recent uh, landmark judgment which was based on Parma patents, the Novartis case. My question is that, sir, considering that the Supreme Court of India took a stance on the Novartis case which was for the protect protection of public health in India and uh, patent protection though was denied on several other grounds but the whole idea was to protect public health in India. So, sir, do you think that judgments like these or the uh, approach that the Apex Court of India is taking towards these issues, is it by any chance, in your view, diluting the very supremacy of patent protection in the global context as such? Um, um, it's a very good question. And I think the access to medicine debate is an important one. It's, it's, it's absolutely the case. The, the question is, how do you, on the demand side, how do you ensure that medicines are affordable? That's a different question. In my mind, there's lots of things you can do on that side. You can provide lots of subsidies. You can, uh, you know, there are many, many things you can do to make sure that medicines are affordable. And so, and, and you know, and there's a lot of good literature. There's a lot of good work that's been done. People like the Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, etc., have done a lot of work in that area um, uh, on the sort of the access to medicine debate. 
Uh, the real question, of course, is if you were to sort of engage in um, you know, this kind of compulsory licensing, you know, what kind of disincentives might it create? And that is on the supply side. Um, and, and that is something to, to you know, take into account. Now, keep in mind also that a lot of pharmaceutical companies nowadays, they engage very actively in price discrimination and make the same drug available at different prices. And price discrimination can, is, is, a fiction, is, is efficient. Um, and, and so I really don't, the way you've set up the question suggests that there is some inherent tension between all these things, and I don't necessarily think so. In other words, it's possible to recognize IP. It's possible to maintain the innovations for the folks who are doing the inventing and who are doing the pioneering work, and it's also possible to make sure that you know, things like valuable medicine, et cetera, is available. And I think that is what the past 15 years has really shown us, is that there is no such tension. There's just different mechanisms that have been, that should be sort of brought to bear to ensure that both these objectives can be realized. Uh, so that you have people who are doing the innovating be compensated, and the people who really simply cannot afford uh, a super competitive price still manage to get access to medicine. Thank you. Just one comment on that. I don't know what this case. Uh, you were talking about the Gleevex case, yes, I suppose. Yes, sir. I, I, I generally have totally agree with the Professor Jay case, but what we have to remember is that, that Gleevex case is some sort of an exception for one particular reason. Section 3D in the Indian Patent Act and whether Section 3D is something um, people are talking about, leave it up. But that was a case which was in a transition, an application filed before Section 3D came into the statute book, started getting examined after it came into Section 3D, uh, came into the, and they did not have the required data to prove enhanced efficacy and all those problems. So the decision of the Supreme Court or the intellectual property revoking the vote, if you see on the facts, I don't think there is any dispute. Whereas if you see subsequently, there are any number of uh, drug and pharmaceutical substances which have come into Section 3D, but they have been able to overcome the requirements of Section 3D and patents have been granted. So Gleevex case, I think you should keep it out of the system because it was during the transition of the 2005 Act which came into existence with the Section 3D and all that. So I don't think uh, uh, because of the Gleevex case, uh, anything has really gone out of com com total control under the patent system in India. That's probably what I wanted to uh, inform you. Thank you. And finally, we have time for one more question. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm Ganguly from the Rajiv Gandhi School. Uh, the point that I want to make is about the compulsory license issue. And the point is, that as far as the Indian system is concerned, I'd refer you to the very epic work of you know, uh, Mr. Aigar, who really, you may call it the author of the 1970 Patent Act, who created all the basic work for it. The issue is the following, that when the government gives you a patent, it's a quick probe of two aspects. One is A, you disclose, which is what you do in the American system and the Indian system, and you disclose uh, in such a way that someone still in the art can reproduce that particular invention. That's a common factor. But there's a second point in India, which you don't do in the United States, and that is that there is a working requirement that having got this particular right, are you using that particular pattern for the benefit of society? And this is a very important myth that every patentee in India gives to the government in return for the right to gets. So now when you look at the commercial license part of it, that if I have not met this reasonable requirement of the public, then what is the consequence? And commercial license comes out of that consequence. So if you look at it from that standpoint, we can debate as to what are the conditions that are laid down in the Patent Act per se over and beyond the over and beyond the disclosure requirements. And if you look at it that way, and if you look at things after the first compulsory license was given in India, the interesting part was whenever an application for a compulsory license was made, if the 
applicant for the compulsory license had not been able to make a reasonable case or a prior physical case, he was not given, his application was rejected. So the first part is that, the second part is the geopolitical reasonable requirements of the party. So I think that's a very important part. So we need to look at the balance very carefully. Yes, sure. Uh, we've got a few times now about the compulsory license, and it clearly is a vital and important issue. I think social justice and the access to medicines is critical as well. We all know that. What I'd like to comment on is that with the last point, it's exactly correct that nation states can decide what kind of bargain they want to offer to inventors and creators. What I want to be cautious with, though, is that, and what I was suggesting before, is then seeing how that bargain then brings out the invention or not. As I've been saying, people invent and they create for their own purposes. You don't need incentives to do that, in my view. You do need incentives to get it out there. <coughs> to be quite honest and somewhat blunt, a lot of the compulsory license issues have happened where there are uh, states that want to access things that have already been disclosed in another country under the terms there and then use them. And so sometimes that becomes the problem. The initial inventor or commercializer disclosed in a different regime thinking they had one kind of bargain and now that bargain doesn't exist somewhere else. But maybe that's just the inventor's problem because it's a global regime. So let me suggest this, without trying to look like I'm shutting down compulsory licenses or any of this, I take that all very seriously. I actually favor working requirements. I'm an outlier in the US that I sometimes think we should have a working requirement in the US, but we don't. Here's the issue. I do have some concerns that if more nation states move to compulsory license and so-called breaking patents and things, you'll see inventors and commercializers finding ways to deliver products, even including pharmaceuticals, as services in closed situations where then outside of that closed proprietary model, you will not be able to access or know what the pharmaceutical compound is. And I think that is a more dangerous state of affairs for global health. So uh, uh, I would love to know how the uh, working requirement is playing out. My concern would be the reason why in the United States we've, we've actually thought about it and we've even had it and we've rejected uh, this working requirement is partly because of our understanding that some people and some companies are good at innovation. Their core competency lies in inventing and innovating and not in advanced R&D, manufacturing, etc. So for example, American universities. American universities produce a tremendous amount of innovation, tremendous amount of new technology, which is the basis of whole big industries. They don't work any of their IP. They simply don't. Why? Because they're not good at it. They, you know, they're good at inventing. They're not good at manufacturing, uh, distribution, marketing, etc. So, so they stick to their core competence. So I worry about something like a working requirement, what that is going to do for some technology development companies, for some individual inventors, for some startups, for some universities, etc. People who are sort of interested only in a piece of the puzzle. You know, I'm only interested in identifying the genetic trait that allows me to control the fat content of the soybean. And, and then I let the ADMs of the world uh, figure out how, how to sort of put this in the soybean and, and manufacture it. And this is sort of what I'm good at, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so, so I, you know, definitely worry about that. I understand that, uh, you know, the working requirement is, is something that uh, is very much part of Indian PAC law. And, I, and since when I'm in a sort of a group of students here, it would really be interesting to see, uh, you know, how that requirement has played out and design a careful empirical study and, 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 and you know, get, bring some more uh, insight and bring some more sort of evidence-based policy making, uh, you know, so, so we can sort of have, you know, a good informed decision. I think that's what Sean was really talking about. Can I make a well, comment? For me, though, is what I think of requirements, can I just make one? Uh, I, I, I think we need to wind it up here because we're well, we're well into our break and it's an interesting debate. I think given the passion surrounding the topic, it will come up again. Uh, so uh, could we all thank our panel and uh, thank you for an excellent start to the conference and uh, we will, uh, we will uh, break for coffee now.
resume in half an hour. Or, oh, please go ahead. You, you are in charge. Listen to her. Thank you for the insightful discussion, sir. Uh, we would like to prevent, uh, present a small token of appreciation to all the panelists. Uh, Professor, I would like to ask you to request you to uh, present the token to all the panelists. Refreshments have been served outside, so we take a short break and resume by 11.35. Uh, washrooms are ready. 